So what I advocate in the book is having a repertoire of practices that you can use at different times according to what you need. And they can be things that we call spiritual. They can just be things that feed your soul and give you solace and calm in the moment. But you have to remember to use them. Let's move on before we go to how we apply. Let's get more specific. Chapter eight, when the blitz hits the fan. When the <laughs> blitz hits, I, I love this one. Okay, immediate interventions. Now, what I thought, yeah. this, this chapter shows different tools, and we're going to go through them to really share it with our community. But what amazed me, what I haven't seen before, Phil, which I really like, is whatever spiritual tool it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time. So what you're saying, spirituality is practical. And if you have three minutes, you can be spiritual in three minutes. If you have two hours, please do meditate for two hours. If you have you know, five minutes to breathe, great. So that you can really time manage your spirituality and still receive a lot. And this is really what hit me about, about your book, uh, which I thought was, to me at least, very innovative. And take us through some of the tools and, and get more specific. Let me, uh, by way of background, my whole premise, and it's not a premise, it's a empirical observation that you know, has been made by wise people throughout time, nothing I'm making up. But deep within us, our, at our core, our essence, is what I call a sanctuary of peace. <clears throat> We are deep within us, always at peace, always content, always at one with the universe, always um, in alignment, stable. But the part of us that's out engaged in the world occupies our attention. But we have access to that inner peace through spiritual, what we call spiritual tools and spiritual practices. So my whole book is based on the notion that if we know how to access this, it becomes more part of our lives. <clears throat> so I advocate having a regular daily spiritual practice that puts you in touch with the inner peace within you, and then you live your life. But we can find the doorway to that inner sanctuary at any time in the midst of life. It becomes easier to access it if we have a daily, regular praxis. But when things happen in the world, we can come back to it. We can as the songwriter Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And the cracks are everywhere. We just need to know where they are and how to access them. So what I advocate in the book is having a repertoire of practices that you can use at different times according to what you need. And they can be things that we call spiritual. They can just be things that feed your soul and give you solace and calm in the moment. But you have to remember to use them. And one of them, just to come back to your question, is the breath. <clears throat> I say that inner peace is only a breath away. It's a, it's a cliche, but I'm sure in every culture, you know, people will say when you're upset, just take a deep breath. And why? Because it, it works, and you can now measure this, you know, in a laboratory. But there's ways to take the deep breath that are more effective than others. So I have instructions in the book for, you know, for example, abdominal breathing, where you, just by extending the belly when you breathe, you're allowing more uh, oxygen, more cleansing oxygen to enter the lungs. And then holding the breath just for a while. And then another interesting little secret that scientists have uh, developed, and that yogis discovered thousands of years ago, when you exhale, 
there's many different ways to exhale. So you can exhale or you can exhale or you can exhale and one is more cleansing in the moment than the other. Well, also more conspicuous. So you have to choose your moment. <laughs> you have to choose the audience that they don't think. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you're alone, <laughs> it's okay. But in uh, the traditional breathing practices, very often you breathe in for, say, four counts and you hold the breath for four counts, but you exhale for six or eight counts. This is many, many hundreds of years old. And why? Scientists have now discovered if you elongate the out breath, the exhale, it's a little longer than usual, and maybe hold it before you breathe in again. You're do I don't want to go into details, but it, it sets off a physiological reaction having to do with the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Yeah, no, no, but this is, this is important. It calms down the parasympathetic it, nervous system, the flight or fight system, as far as exactly. I'm and it has it's mediated by the vagus nerve, and it's a known phenomenon now. So just that one thing can be immediately calming. And gives you, you, know, you may not think of it as a spiritual practice because your doctor or your psychotherapist told you to do it. But so did the yogis. And, you know, it gives you access to inner calm. So whether you call it spiritual or just a physiological, doesn't matter. They, no, they, it's practical. It's, it's very interesting. And I don't know, I'm sure actually you might know Wim Hof. He is one of the gurus of breathing and he is the guy that teaches breathing and he is the one that gets covered for eight hours in ice and survives, uh, even though physiologically yeah. it's impossible. And his source... I don't of advocate that. You know, no, no, I don't advocate. <laughs> don't try this at home. Okay. Like Mary Poppins, you know, <laughs> jumping out of the window with an umbrella. Don't try that at home. However, he really got into breathing and the study of breathing and what it does physiologically, what it changes physiologically big time because he does this, I uh, did this ice swimming and it's very interesting studies and, and there's yeah. so much online about him, uh, perhaps for anybody that is interested in, in that. Yeah. In and there's, there's um, you know, evidence piling up about these things all the time. So that's one. And I, I just happened to open to that section on elongating the exhale uh, and there's many other things to do i mean if you want to explore some just well here's another quickie a quick uh, tip sure. um in the in the heat of the moment um if you can just switch your, your attention to the senses to what's happening to in the in the realm of sensory experience at that moment it takes you out of the mental uh, turmoil. And the, of all the five senses, uh, the sense of touch somehow is the most immediate. It takes your attention. So if you, if you just you know, grip the table uh, and put your attention on, how it, on the feel of it, it's, it's, you know, people will carry an amulet or something in, in, you know, to, and they'll go to that or worry beads and they'll go to that and just, you know, touch, shifting attention to the sense of touch in that moment. And you can do that, in, you know, in the middle of a, a crowd. Well, not, you won't be in a crowd in COVID time, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, even you can do that inconspicuously just by touching something in your pocket holding your key, putting your attention on that. It's grounding. It takes you out of the rage reaction, out of the fear response, and ha you know, just puts you in the moment so that you have that pause. Yeah, and another thing that really also struck a chord with me, um, Phil, is learn. Rumi yeah. said, whatever happens to us, you know, it's a learning opportunity. And again, um, in Kabbalah, if we have an obstacle to overcome for us, it's actually just an opportunity to learn and to evolve. And which I thought was very, very important also as a reminder, if you are in the midst of crazy times that you look around and say, okay, so what is my lesson? What am I supposed to learn? And how do we, with that 
um, consciousness, that attitude, grow out of it in a positive way. Yes, and, and I think that's terribly important. And that, that may not be easy to do in the moment, but two minutes later or whatever, you can say, okay, what am I to learn about this? What am I to learn about how I reacted to this? What am I to learn from the situation I'm in? And I think right now, collectively, everybody in the world should be thinking, what can we learn from this pandemic? That would have been my next question. Tell us, what do you think? Um, Well, for one thing, every individual has his or her own lessons to learn. Uh, And those of us who are fortunate enough to be um, relatively untouched, who, 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 if we and our loved ones have not been sick uh, and have, we've lost nobody we care about to, to COVID, if we're not in jeopardy of losing our homes or not being able to feed our children, um, then one thing we can learn is gratitude for that. And another thing we can learn is compassion and empathy for those who are suffering. These are spiritual qualities that I think even you know any secular person would also think of as virtuous. And so we can learn to cultivate that. Individually, maybe we learn to take better care of ourselves in the future so we're less vulnerable to any disease. Maybe we learn, and this is a big one, I'm hoping that we can all learn collectively how interconnected we are. Because if nothing, you know, I was in India when the COVID broke out and all of a sudden you realize I'm going to be changing planes and airports and I'm connected to all these people arriving in the Singapore airport where I'm going to be and we're transmitting possibly disease to one another. The world's economy has been affected. It, and if we don't realize that now, if global warming hasn't taught us that, maybe the pandemic will, and we'll have a greater sense of our connectedness to one another, our interdependency with one another, and maybe uh, we'll be a little less selfish, a little less uh, um, nationalistic, a little bit more conscious of our uh, oneness. As, as a human species. And even if that happens just on an individual level, it will have a reverberating effect. Absolutely. And so I, I would hope that we grow in those ways from, uh, I'm often asked, what do I think will happen after you know the pandemic or after the US election and all that? I don't make predictions, but I do know one thing that whatever happens will be because we made it happen. It's, you know, nothing is inevitable. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely, absolutely. We have our choices. Yeah, that is exactly the point I would like to make, and that really wraps up also um, with this question, our, our wonderful conversation, um, Phil, and that is really the, the key learnings is, in your book, I get the feeling very much, you know, it's up to you. We can take responsibility. If we want change, we want to be part of that change. We want to be the change um, that we want to see. So it does not matter if we feel like a drop in the ocean. We will make a difference because if it is, uh, you know, transmitting through to the others, my behavior can impact your behavior in a positive way. And so it moves on like dominoes. Yeah. So I, I think what is, you know, the, the, the most important question here, 45 or almost 50 years of spiritual studying from, from your side, Phil, what would you say are the, the key learnings of being involved with spirituality, practicing it, teaching it, writing books about it, you would want to pass on right now as, you know, times are really pivotal and perhaps a new cycle circle is upon us? Um, In the book, I talk about the spiritual two-step, and that sort of summarizes the key uh, premises of the book, what I wanted to bring out. First, as I said before, we all have a sanctuary of peace within us. Access to that is not only important in crazy times, it's important at all times. It, it nourishes and feeds our lives because that sanctuary of peace is also 
the source of joy and happiness and love and compassion and wisdom and all the things we seek in life. It's within, <clears throat> it's within us. These, that is the key spiritual teachings of every tradition and more and more of you know, what psychology and neuroscience is discovering. We can be happy within regardless of what's happening outside of us and it gives us the opportunity to retain some calm and presence even in the midst of uh, difficulty, difficult times in our lives or collectively. But the other part of that, the two-step, is that we, that inner sanctuary is also a fortress of strength. And it's a platform for more effective behavior. Spirituality has always been been unfortunately associated with disconnection from the world, being non-realistic, being a space cadet, all that. And, and men, some spiritual teachings, you know, encourage that disengagement. But it doesn't have to be that way. And most of the great spiritual people we, we think about in the history of the world were very much engaged. They were in there doing the, the work of the world from an inner platform of peace and wisdom and kindness and love. You think of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and you know, all, the, all the others. These are, so I devote eight chapters of my book to personal spiritual practices you know, and all that. But the last chapter is about spiritual citizenship because yes. I think yes. we're, we're now called upon to come out and from a deep place of peace and love, contribute something to make the world a better place, a saner place. And this is a terribly important thing, especially now in, this, in these times we live in. And as you said, even a little drop, you know, as I quote, I end, I end the book by quoting the Buddha, I'm paraphrasing, uh, every little drop eventually will fill a large vessel. Yeah. And so small acts of kindness or large ones, you know, running for office, uh, taking on a career of service, being of service to others and to the world is also a spiritual practice. And every tradition encourages that. It's one of the good things about religion. They all cover, they all advocate doing some good for those in need, serving, uh, being of service. And the reason they do is it's not only good for society and the world, it's good for us to yes. get out of our egos from time to time and stop yes. being so selfish and do some good for others. People have noticed this. You know, uh, you know I, I volunteered for the day or I wrote a check to help somebody or I called my neighbor, my elderly neighbor, you know, to see how they were doing in, in the midst of social isolation and you know offered to bring them some groceries these little acts make us feel better they enrich our soul so the more we do it the better we'll all better off we'll all be in the time absolutely and that is a wonderful wonderful way for to to um finish our conversation thank you so so much uh thank for you. this insight i think this is such an invaluable book and thinking that you actually wrote it two years before COVID 19 <laughs> broke out <laughs> and i wonder <laughs> you must have thought oh my god times could not get any worse i need to write this book and all of a sudden you know the next thing you know this that's is exactly awesome. right everybody uh, congratulating me for my good time yeah right? the crystal ball you see there's something <laughs> oh, no. it, was, it was crazy enough last year when i wrote it <laughs> well anyway thank you so much Phil, and thank you very much dear mentorate tv community i hope you enjoyed my conversation with phil goldberg do try to get this book spiritual practice for crazy times it really is very hands-on it explains not only about spirituality what you can do with it that is the most important thing how you implement it in order to really soothe your soul and with this stronger soul to really uh, kind of share it also amongst the others and just tone everything a little bit down from whatever craziness is happening around you see you next time